Now, our next keynote speaker is a global leader of Future of Work at Deloitte. Uh, he serves uh, Fortune 500 clients uh, across the globe of Deloitte. And uh, he helps his clients to redefine their future of work culture towards more agility, innovation and growth. He's also a renowned lecturer and writer and it is a real pleasure to have him in our program today. So uh, let's move to Boston, to Steve Hatfield. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Hatfield and I'm the Global Future of Work Leader at Deloitte. It's my pleasure to be here and I'm here to talk to you about some of the trends that we've been talking about in market regarding the future of work from the insights that we've gleaned from our human capital trend study um, for four or five years now. The trend study that we've done is the largest longitudinal study of its kind. This is the 10th year that we've produced it. And we started to see these trends back in 2016 and 2017. I've been, been in the role since 2018. And what's been very interesting, of course, is these trends started to exist pre-pandemic and of course have been accelerated post. And so now it's important to take a look at them to understand the direction of travel around what will emerge in the future. With that, let's get started. The presentation is titled Navigating to Recovery and Thriving, Work Transformed. It's about returning to work in the future of work and following the trends through the embracing of purpose, potential, and offering perspective to our workforce. Let me start with a few numbers. 65, 80, and 4. The World Economic Forum said pre the pandemic that 65% of the world's school children would be in jobs that don't yet exist. At the time, we had over 80 million gig workers in the US, the UK, and India. And yet, for all of the dy dynamic around future of work trend lines, really only 4% of the US workforce worked remotely in any real capacity full time. And then post pandemic, 2.7, three out of four, 77. 2.7 billion people have been impacted by lockdowns and sheltering in place. Four out of five workers globally. And moderately quickly after the pandemic started, three out of four CFOs came forward in a Gartner study and said that we would keep at least 20% of our workforces remote. In part, this is working. And then a study that we did with Forbes, 77% of the CEOs surveyed said that they would accelerate their digital transformations because they've been helpful in maintaining a bit of resiliency and capability needed in the pandemic. So it's interesting. These trend lines existed pre-COVID and of course have been accelerated post. It's well um, characterized in a, my favorite quote from Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is a Princeton economist and head of the New Enterprise Foundation. She said, the coronavirus has been a time machine to the future. That the trend lines that we expected to see happening over decades are instead increasing over the span of weeks. And with that, how do we then think about where these trend lines will take us? Well, I think in order to understand that, it's important to step back a little bit and think about the evolution of how we've thought about work over time. So work and technology has been part of the work, um, the work process and part of how we thought about work back to the first industrial revolution when we brought machines to the workplace. And then of course, through the second industrial revolution, we um, adapted further. We created assembly lines and we created production lines and it became much more about that level of efficiency and that level of output. And then of course we moved into the third industrial revolution which is all about computing power and bringing computers to, to the workplace and the greater analytical capabilities that that enabled for us. And then the World Economic Forum declared in 2016 that we'd moved into the fourth industrial revolution, that it was much different now. It was about the cyber and the physical worlds coming together. And of course, that's happening at a rapid clip because the technologies that are being introduced are exponential. They're increasing in performance power and having in cost every 18 months. And the impact they're having on the work, workforce, and workplace is substantial. And yet, for all the technologies that we've been bringing to the workplace, 
we have not seen the lift in productivity that we saw in the, in the um, revolutions prior. So over the last 10 years, it's been very clear that globally, our productivity is going down, no matter how much we've been spending on all these technologies. You can see the trend lines here, the bright blue one for the world total, but it's happening across all economies, emerging, mature economies, the United States, it's happening across the globe. And so what's underneath some of this? What is it that is driving the inability for these investments in technology to actually create the productivity that we would hope to see? Well, I think it's because we're still rooted in old ways of thinking. These are three economists, Nobel Prize winners, and sociologists that in some respects have shaped how we still think about the work, the workforce, and the workplace. Frederick Taylor and Taylorism did a variety of different studies, and he's framed how we think about efficiency. And it's about time in motion, it's about production, it's about output, it's about the faster and quicker way that we can continue to move through bringing widgets across that production line. And his ideas of efficiency still permeate into how we think about efficiency and productivity today. Ronald Course, Nobel Prize winner, created the, therm of, uh, the, the theory of the enterprise, the theory of the firm. And his, he posited that we bring all sorts of functions together under one umbrella in an enterprise because of the, the friction costs between them. The transaction costs are too great to keep them separate. But of course, his theories were, were produced in the first half of the 20th century. And now we're looking at an environment where we don't have the, that friction any further. The more and more that we're connected on digital platforms, the nature of the enterprise can change. It becomes something far more um, of an ecosystem. And so why do we still hold to the old theories about how an, how an enterprise ought to be of a variety of different functions and capabilities all under one roof? And then finally, William H. White, he wrote the book Organization Man. It was all about sublimating the needs of the individual to the greater good of the organization and becoming part and parcel of a large group. His theories around groupthink still permeate. And so do we need to have individuals that are crit critically sort of subverted, if you will, to the broader, broader organizational culture and broader organizational norms? And I think these all step into sort of, I would say outdated ways in which we're still thinking about work, workforce, workplace. And so as we step back and think about the future, we need to think about these three and the way they iterate across each other. Now by work, we're talking about outcomes, we're talking about the activities, we're talking about the value that's created by workforce, skills and human capabilities, different talent models, the actual nature of the job and its composition. And by workplace, it's the digital technologies now that make the workplace happen. It's your culture, but it's also your physical design. It's your geographical location strategy. And in order for us to move forward into the next normal, we believe that we need to think about these three in different ways. So it's about re-architecting the work. We need to rethink what work is and why, and how are we doing it on these technologies? We need to move away from old ways of thinking around the production line, around the workforce. It's about unleashing the workforce, not just because the workforce is a vast ecosystem, but unleashing their potential and seeing how it is that we can lean into the broad ecosystem of a workforce that actually is the reality of today. <clears throat> and then in workplace, it's about adapting adapting it to be something different than what we have had in the past. So as we start to think about work, I think it's very important to think about the, the trend line around both human and technology integration and the trend line around the impact that's taking place within the organization. Often the discussion has been one of um, substitution of workers with technology. And so that becomes in a cost and efficiency conversation. But very infrequently is that conversation something more akin to the value that's being created and or the meaning that we can bring to the work and the worker. And so the real impact, moving from efficiency to greater productivity to growth and to the art of the possible, actually takes place as you start thinking about how do you augment workers and how do you move into what's really possible with these technologies and how do you figure out 
what technology is really good at, so it can do those things, and what humans are really good at, and focusing them on what they bring to the table most. And so <clears throat> often the workplace over time has had many, many different technologies come together and they've grown organically, they've grown over time. They've not, they've not been brought to, to bear, if you will, against the work itself in the most deliberate and effective way. And so you end up with collaboration toolkits and you end up with different workflow systems and you end up with different legacy technologies and the ERP systems and the way that all of these things on the left side of the screen kind of play off of each other. <clears throat> it's time to step back and realize that actually it's a stack of technologies that have to be uniquely created against the actual work itself. What, are we, what is it that the workforce uses around communication and collaboration? How is it that cognitive and robotics comes to the table to enable them? What are the data visualization tools? What are the file sharing tools? How do we capture knowledge? And how do we manage workflow and task management underneath that? And in thinking about how to bring these technologies together, one has to start with the work and redesigning it against these technologies. Of course, doing what these technologies do to, that, that they are particularly uh, um, geared to do and, and elevating what humans do in terms of their capabilities. Why do we talk about the workforce as unleashed? Why does one need to unleash the workforce? Well, it's already happened. The workforce has been unleashed. I think this has ever been more, pre more obvious since um, the pandemic happened. The questions that clients are asking us most now are about efficiency and productivity, about culture, about leadership. How do I govern and manage this highly distributed, highly virtual workforce? But we were already just managing a highly distributed virtual workforce. Large global organizations were already working in environments where people were, were far, far great, had a far greater distribution, <clears throat> where they were connected via these technologies, where you we were using these toolkits to connect across time and across different geographies. Already organizations were tapping into a, a variety of different um, partners and ecosystem players that were helping them deliver on certain capabilities in, their, in these outcomes. We had already moved in that direction. The pandemic just shed a light on it. It pushed us into an environment where we were fully distributed. <clears throat> and of course, in that environment, it started to stress the way in which we had been operating again back to the old ways of thinking. And so right away, it becomes interesting. If you think about it from an ecosystem standpoint, if you think about it as a large hive of activity geared to the various work outcomes that you have in place, suddenly the dynamic around what is talent management needs to shift. It's about workforce and workforce management. It's no longer attract, develop, and retain. It's actually much more about access, curate, and engage. It's about accessing the capabilities and the talent you need across that ecosystem when you need it and redeploying it and directing it at the work at hand and the work that needs to be done. It's about de developing consumer grade technologies and experiences in the workplace itself that help bring learning and development into the flow of work, but also enable your workforce to sort of grow and become more capable and more able to deliver on those human capabilities that are most critical to what you're trying to get done. And then finally, it's about engaging. And that engagement can happen in a variety of different ways, a different workplace, <clears throat> a different um, leadership model, um, the actual work itself and the nature of the contribution that people are making. But it's about tethering that broad ecosystem connected to the work that you're doing and the outcomes that you want. And therefore, we need to focus on outcomes, focus on impact, and adapt our processes and systems to this larger ecosystem and managing it in a different way. And then finally, how do we look at the workplace? And the Economist put out a study that said that, that you know, our views of the workplace were shaped back in the 1800s, the British East India Company and what it created in terms of everybody under one, in one umbrella in one building to the extent that they were all together, right, in London. The workplace, we think of it very much like a castle. It's about 
getting through the gate and across the moat and into the building. And it's everybody who's in the building is safe to work with. And we work with them and we interact with them. And there are the walls and the protection mechanisms around those that belong and those that don't. And that mindset around the workplace has long ago shifted, but we haven't uh, we adapted how we think about the workplace accordingly. It's much more about a, um, a train station. The metaphor of the castle and the train station resonates because the train station is how we actually operate today. It's about technologies that are connecting us. It's about people coming and going, different, different players showing up, delivering different capabilities. It's about the digital platforms that help organize. It's about the workflow, who arrives when. It's about the sharing of information, but which information is available. And it's about the nature of the workplace as a destination. You come to the workplace for certain reasons. You need to be there because you need to collaborate. You need to be there because it's a, it, it's a way you develop relationships and culture. You need to be there because it's the way in which you're going to get work done. And yet the workplace itself still isn't organized in a way that can, can adapt to that broad ecosystem. And so how do we consider the workplace in a way that it's much more of a fluid destination, that it's actually a combination of the physical and the digital? And so with that, there are seven trends in our human capital trends report <clears throat> that I'd like to touch on. These all in some respects help frame what we think about in terms of purpose, potential, and perspective. So first, belonging. From culture, from comfort to connection and contribution. Belonging was the number one trend in our, in our report. Over 93% of the respondents said that belonging was critical to organizational success in the future. Yet only about 12% were ready to do anything about it. Well, by belonging, it's more than just, are we comfortable in the workplace? It's actually about tethering people to it. It's about creating connection and helping them appreciate the contribution that they're making. And that is how they then um, engage and stay connected to you. Second trend, well-being and designing work for well-being. Again, very highly um, recognized trend. Somewhere in the vicinity of 79% of the people surveyed said that, that well-being is critical to their work success, yet very few, somewhere in the teens, are anyone doing anything about it. What this is, is about taking um, well-being and connecting it to the work itself. And it is about the trend line that we were seeing around performance in terms of human performance. And work and being concerned about elevating humans and how they perform and making sure that they are caring for their well being in a way that enables them to perform at their very best. Some of this came out right away in the pandemic for all the obvious reasons, but it's things like zoom fatigue. It's things like being on on, on endless video conferencing calls. It's things like the blurring between work life and home life that's resulted from all of us working remotely that has sort of put a bright spotlight on the importance of this level of well-being and care in order for us to elevate humans in their performance going forward. Super teams, putting AI in the group. In our pre previous trends, we saw super jobs, different jobs emerging as technologies started to adapt and take away part of what people were doing that enabled them to spend their time doing other and better and more interesting things and allowed them to create different connections across different types of work activity. In, in terms of this study, what was very interesting to us is that 60% of the respondents said that they were actually augmenting their workforce with AI. Dramatically different view than what we were seeing a few years ago with the extent to which the dialogue was much more about substituting robots taking our jobs, not making our jobs better and different. And so now what it's really becoming is much more about how is AI being embedded into the work of the group? And how are we taking advantage of that to collaborate differently and create better outcomes? And are we actually spending time and energy thinking about how we need to reskill and upskill accordingly to enable us to understand how to take advantage of these technologies? Knowledge management, creating context for a connected world. This one is very critical. It's become very interesting as a result of us all working on these digital platforms. We have access to more information and need access to more information digitally than we ever had before. But still, organizations are thinking largely about knowledge management as file sharing, over 55% of those surveyed. And so though people see knowledge management as critical in order to create a collective intelligence of our organization and all of that, those players that are, are within it, 
they're not actually bringing to life systems and processes that enable the capture of that knowledge, the distribution of that knowledge, the curation of that knowledge. It's possible today with AI toolkits to understand what different teams are doing in terms of what work they're producing and how to connect dots across other teams that are doing related and similar things. Behavioral nudges to connect teams to sort of further see the knowledge that's being created by the organization and further it into the marketplace. Beyond reskilling, what we see here is that organizations continue to grapple with how to upskill and reskill our workforce, which is critical. But as, as, as it's unfolded, organizations are still thinking about it in terms of skills, as opposed to thinking about it in terms of capabilities. And skills in of itself becomes a bit of a treadmill. GitHub says that the half-life of a technical skill is 18 months. The half-life of a business skill is two to five years. What was interesting about the pandemic is it uncovered the fact that organizations didn't really have a good view of the actual capabilities their workforce brought to the table. They might have understood the specific skill that was outlined in someone's job description, but they didn't understand what fully that person brought to the table. And in the moment when, in some cases, frontline workers were sort of asked in many respects to stand down because they were not going to be engaged in the retail shops or the, or the uh, bank branches or whatever it might have been, the back office staff were sort of experiencing um, a surge in, in, in workflow and a need for extra help. And it was difficult to redeploy people from the front to the back, in part because they didn't think about, well, what are the skills that we, what are the capabilities that we really have versus just the skills? And how do I know what those capabilities are? And how do I deploy them? And so if you focus on a capability development, if you focus on enduring human capabilities like um, complex systems thinking and storytelling and being able to analyze data sets and hypothesis driven problem solving and you understand who has those in what capacity you can begin to bring them to the different customer missions that you have and the different needs depending upon the dramatic changes that happen in the market our sixth governing workforce strategies this is about workforce data sets this is about understanding the needs and, and capabilities of your workforce. This is about understanding how the organization is operating. This is about moving beyond sort of pulse surveys that take place sort of on a, um, um, once a year to understand levels of engagement, but rather happening, them happening more frequently and them happening in a way that enables you to access an inf this information and use it to calibrate how you're governing this workforce. Some of what's taking place now is org network analysis and using that because it gives you a better picture of how an organization is really operating, who's connecting with whom in what way, and where might there be barriers that you need to adapt and change. And in a, in a highly distributed virtual workforce ecosystem, this becomes more and more critical. Do we have the right information to enable leaders to do the right thing in terms of guiding and directing that organization against what's taking place? And then finally, ethics and moving from could we to should we. And we believe that ethics becomes very, very critical in the future of work. There's many, many questions that it raises around the sorts of benefits programs that you're offering your workforce, about the different persona-based workforce, customized workforce strategies that you consider around how you're bringing some of these tools to life and what does that mean for differently enabled workers, around diversity and inclusion. And how do you bring that to the table in, in the most critical and effective way? And how do you think about that as it permeates the rest of what we've, we're talking about here in terms of belonging and the way the team is formed and how leaders lead and how knowledge is created? These ethical questions become paramount and ones that we absolutely need to step back and consider as we're moving forward. And for that, our leadership needs to offer that because that's part of the perspective that they need to be able to bring to the table to help their workforce understand it. Um, and so in our study, it became apparent somewhere in the vicinity of 80% of those that were surveyed felt that ethics was a, was a, was a very critical consideration, but only 20% of the work of, of those studied said that, or those responded said that there was anything their organization was actually doing about it. And so we think that that gap is important and one that needs to be address, addressed. And so with that, the fundamental question that pops for us is, how do we remain distinctly human in a technology-driven world? How do we bring the DNA of humans and technology together around purpose, potential, 
and perspective? And how do we chart the course through a bit of the paradox, belonging yet individuality, um, sort of an odd twist on what William Foote White says about the organization man. Reinvention, the ongoing reinvention, yet security in terms of our connection and the value, a, an odd twist in terms of the potential and focusing on potential in our workforce. And then perspective, how do we stay bold amongst all this uncertainty? And how do we help ballast our organization and direct it and frame it against that boldness, even as the, the marketplace sends um, signals that might be confusing or difficult or problematic. And so as I wrap, there are a few actions that I recommend organizations consider. So first, to chart the course, you need to step back and think about work differently. It's time to re-architect it. Re-architect it so that we're not just lifting and shifting onto all these video Zoom calls. The dialogue about what will emerge in the future in terms of a hybrid mix of the physical and digital workplace necessitates that we think about work and how to elevate what's really important and effective for humans versus what technology does best. Second, develop the right analytics. Spend time thinking about what it is that you really need to measure and how do you measure it. Productivity is not just a matter of output anymore. It's about the efficiency of your workforce, the efficacy of the tools that they can use, the empowerment that they have to move forward to, to drive the outcomes that are, that are critical. Do they exhibit the right behaviors? Do they know what those behaviors are? So you are obviously going to continue to measure the right KPIs around what it is that you're producing. But there are more um, interesting cuts of data that you can now gather, especially thanks to the fact that most of us are on toolkits of this sort. These digital platforms provide sort of more insight if you tap into them correctly. And understanding how to calibrate against those worker, um, worker sentiment becomes critical. Building adaptability into your organization to create greater resiliency. We saw this right away in the pandemic. Those organizations that had alternative talent models that were able to provide different opportunities for their workforce to be furloughed onto gig platforms, to enable those workers to then find um, different things to do during the period where they were going to have a different level of capacity in the organization than previously understood, or those that had internal opportunity marketplaces were able to, that were able to understand the different needs and capabilities of their workforce and redeploy within their own enterprise, found greater resiliency. There are digital toolkits today that can enable you to connect into a broader ecosystem of workers and enable you to understand how to redeploy the workforce that you have quickly and effectively. And that adaptability needs to be part of how your organization is structured and how it operates. Fourth, you need to create a different mix of the physical and digital workplace. So it's not about a few collaboration toolkits that you've adapted over time. It's, it's about, as you re-architect work, it shapes what it is that you need to have in terms of both a physical workplace and a digital workplace. When do we need to be together based on the work to collaborate, to work in a lab, to work on a whiteboard, to strategize? When can we be apart based on the needs of the work and to, to, to do our work on these collaboration toolkits using workflow management systems or other tools that enable us to do virtual um, development and thinking, computer-aided design and so forth. And so how do we bring those to bear in a way that is more reinforcing against the work itself? And then finally, how do you access, curate and engage your workforce? How do you understand their preferences and think about the strategies that are, going to, that are going to be the most efficacious for directing them, engaging them, and tethering them to some extent to your mission and your goals. What we're seeing is a broad set of different customizable workforce strategies based on an understanding of worker preferences. It's no longer about one um, sort of model for rewards and benefits. It's about having different worker personas and different subsets of different models that you can come to, that can be brought to bear for what a workforce or a particular worker would need within the broader workforce. Much of this is now emerging as a result of the dynamics of realizing that we can actually stay tethered to the organization, but work from anywhere. Yet, if we do that, it means we need 
different travel budgets, different work from home stipends, different maybe labor cost adjustments. And so many, many organizations are now stepping back and thinking about how do I rebuild the different workforce strategies and the different programs to keep that workforce tethered to me. To do so, you need to understand worker preferences to make that happen. And so with that, let me wrap with this quote from Thomas Friedman. Some of our leaders want to build a wall against the hurricane, but you have to build an eye that moves within the storm, that draws energy from it and creates a platform of dynamic stability within it. It's not about trying to bolster yourself against these, the, the, the hurricane and the market uncertainty and the different dynamics that are gonna come your way. It's about creating that stability that is the eye of the storm and can move as the, as, the, as the hurricane adapts and moves along. And so with that, everyone, let me close. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate that um, you are all interested in hearing this presentation. And I'm looking forward to being part of the roundtable discussions to follow. Thank you.